Welcome back to the second day of the symposium Post-Postmodernism, a map for the present, which accompanies the exhibition Everything at Once, Postmodernity 1967 to 1992 at the Bundeskunsthalle in Bonn. We have another packed day of prominent speakers um, that traveled from New York, from Berlin, um, from London. And um, I have advice whenever you plan to curate a show on postmodernism or postmodernity, as we prefer to say, talk to Sylvia Levin, who teaches at Princeton University. She's one of the leading thinkers about uh, postmodern architecture, but not only about architecture, but the whole shifts of power that have come in the 70s and 80s after the deregulation of the financial markets and other social transformation. Sylvia Levin coined the term postmodernization and illustrated it brilliantly with the show Architecture Itself and Other Postmodernization Effects at the CCA, the Canadian Centre for Architecture in Montreal, in 2018. I also recommend the accompanying book. We were glad to be able to talk to Sylvia also in preparation for the show, and she had crucial advice. Sylvia is currently working on her book Building Sylvan Media. She has contributed to the catalogue of the exhibition with her essay Helicoptering Over the Present, or who has never been postmodernized, and she will now uh, talk us through how the helicopter has changed the world. Sylvia, thanks so much. The stage is yours. Thank you, um, I can't see. Thank you very much for that gracious introduction and for inviting me here, and congratulations on a fascinating um, exhibition. Uh, okay. Okay. Suspended within the vertiginous chasm of the Museum of Modern Art's Marum Atrium, there hangs a Bell 47D1 helicopter. MoMA's description explains, and I quote, that designed in 1945, more than 3,000 Bell 47D1 helicopters were made in the United States and sold in 40 countries between 1946 and 73. While the Bell 47D1 is a straightforward utilitarian craft, its designer, Arthur Young, who was also a poet and a painter, consciously juxtaposed its transparent plastic bubble with the open structure of its tail boom to create an object whose delicate beauty is inseparable from its efficiency. That the plastic bubble is made in one piece rather than in sections joined by metal seams sets the Bell 47D1 apart from other helicopters. The result is a cleaner, more unified appearance. That's the end of their description. But so MoMA, in other words, presents the helicopter as an ideal modernist object, one that exemplifies the institution's understanding of the conditions of its own mid-century modernity. In this account, the bell is an American re-origination of European functionalism, benevolently exported as a commodity, valued less as a machine than for its machine aesthetic. This particular helicopter, however, was acquired by the Museum of Modern Art in 1984, the same year Fred Jameson published his seminal essay on postmodernism, in which he uses the helicopter precisely to exemplify a new kind of postmodern machine, which he describes, and I quote, does not, like the older modernist machinery of the locomotive or the airplane, represent motion, but which can be only represented in motion, end quote. Thus, this Bell 47D1 is simultaneously a straightforward addition to MoMA's collection of modernist machines, but it is also a retrospective, re retrospectively fabricated postmodernist object, an object that has been subjected to MoMA's becoming postmodern. The object description is a text 
text of the 1980s, full of slippery anachronisms that turn the object into a pastiche, decontextualized but also recontextualized by its presentation and simulated flight. The helicopter hangs in the unmappable space of the hyperreal, and not merely functional, but its very objecthood is sublimated into weightless appearance. After all, by 1984, this helicopter, the Bell 47, was not just a helicopter, but it was a media icon. I could spend half an hour just showing you all of the television shows um, and films and other media systems in which this helicopter flew. Reinforcing its presentation of the helicopter as image sign, MoMA's description concludes with a remarkable series of linguistic implosions and shifters that create a semantic cloud obscuring what was well known in 1984 about the environmental impact of the so-called dragonfly. So everybody knew that warfare had become environmental thanks to the helicopter, and that killing bugs happened with DDT. Despite all of this, MoMA says the bubble lends the aircraft an insect-like appearance, thus its nickname, the bug-eyed helicopter. Hovering in the space of pure opticality, the 1984 acquisition exemplifies Jameson's definition of postmodernity as the obfuscation of economic and material conditions into spectacle and floating signifiers. While the capacity of the helicopter to operate as both a modern ideal and as a postmodernist icon raises important questions of periodization, style, and aesthetic techniques like appropriation, it also points to the usefulness of considering the helicopter not only as a means of reinscribing theorizations of the postmodern produced during the 1980s, thus produced from within, so to speak, but also as a means of engaging other theoretical frameworks more elemental than semiotic, more procedural than projective, that suggest ways in which we might consider the helicopter as a fundamental cultural technique in the operation of what I have called postmodernization. The helicopter is both subject and object of a process of entanglement between and feedback among a growing number of complexes, the best known of which was the military industrial complex, so named by Eisenhower in 61, but that by the mid 1980s included the military entertainment complex, the industrial academic complex, the art architecture complex, and so on. This complex of complexes re, re compose the linear systems of modernization, linear cities, linear lines of industrial production, linear perspective, into a dynamic and global network of operations generated by the convergence of its various parts. The affordances of the helicopter as it went from beautiful machine to spectacular image reveal it to have been a medium through which cultural infrastructures were relocated to the unstable space found between one building and another, between land and real estate, between persons and machines. This airspace, in a material and, and environmental sense, is what distinguishes helicopters from other aircraft. Helicopters don't merely move through the air or use air pressure to rise. Helicopters reside in the air in ways that are continuous with the way humans live in the Earth's atmosphere. It's one of the reasons that they were so useful in war. Typically, with an altitude average of about 10,000 feet, the upper limit of helicopter flight is determined by both the pilot's and the engine's ability to breathe thinner air. Above 10,000 feet, both humans and helicopters need supplemental oxygen and forms of containment that remove them from what we could call normal air. Helicopters are highly maneuverable, able not only to go up and down, forward and back, but to quickly control shifts in those directions in agility that is typically associated with biological life rather than mechanical motion. This fine motor adaptiveness, so to speak, leads to territorial adaptiveness. Helicopters do well in both urban and rural environments in ways that train their human uh, uh, subjects to become themselves environmentally strategic.
Although related to a whole series of other aerological instruments, from balloons to telegraphs, helicopters importantly acclimatized humans to the information environment in formation. The helicopter's ability to occupy and produce this medial atmosphere was already visible in 1960. The opening sequence uh, of Fellini's La Dolce Vita features not one but two helicopters that fly a Christ figure over the outskirts of Rome through airspace in which the concrete dust-filled atmosphere of the city under construction below and the heavenly sky above converge. Um, I don't need to show you this. Ah, I can't find my mouse. It's a kind of amazing sequence, but I won't play the whole thing. I just will speed it up and show you that at the end, the actual, <laughs> the actual airspace in which the people in the helicopters are sitting and where the women are sunbathing uh, becomes like a single, a single space. So the, um, so the helicopter contains space, it, it moves through the space, and it contains space occupied by a journalist, a photographer, and a telephone that fill the interior with the systems of mass communication. So this air that feeds uh, Fellini's reformulation of life also fed what has been called uh, the golden age of helicoptering in the United States. By the early 1960s, helicopters had become essential to the Vietnam War. I just want to be clear, you're, you're looking at a mobile hospital. Um, you don't see the helicopters in this image, but this is a, a kind of helicopter phenomena. The parts of this were brought in by helicopter. The inflatable sections are using the same air that is required by the helicopters, and the whole thing is powered by jet fuel um, that fuels the helicopter and is brought in uh, by them. Uh, uh, so, okay, so by this time, the U.S. government also actively subsidized the use of helicopters for civilian transportation, most of which were piloted by Vietnam vets, particularly in cities where federal investments in freeways um, had reduced the availability of mass transit. As a result, it was cheaper and cleaner to take a helicopter from Kennedy Airport to the Pan Am building in Midtown Manhattan than it was to take a taxi. This economy normalized the, the use of the helicopter and also turned them into forms of entertainment. This entertainment transit complex uh, drew in the military civilian complex, along with helicopter visualities dependent on the wide viewing angle provided by their panoramic windows and the way in which the hovering enabled the witnessing of events as they folded in time and motion. This maneuverability enabled the helicopter to get low to the surface of the earth, to take certain kinds of images, producing then a new telescope helicopter surveillance complex. As a result, live television broadcasting of everything from dam breaks to racial uprisings became possible and aerial policing of urban populations standard policy. By the late 1960s, vertical lift, urban maneuverability, and visibility somewhere between near and far made helicopters ubiquitous as well as polymorphous instruments of the informatic link linkages that drove postmodernization. When artists and architects engaged with helicopters, which they did with increasing frequency, they were unavoidably uh, drawn into this informatically integrative airspace. I could show you a lot of these images. This is a project by uh, the guy who would form Super Studio in a few years, and there's people on one side and helicopters in the, on the other uh, with a hydroelectric dam uh, in between everybody, let's say, breathing in the same Mediterranean air. Images of architects using helicopters not only to bring components and plug them into structure, but to use that plugging in to plug architecture into a 
kind of transit entertainment communication complex became uh, became uh, sort of standard at this point. Um, artists are flying around to look at things that you can't see unless you're in a helicopter, using helicopter equipment to make their work. The piston that here is, and the, uh, the hydraulic system is a helicopter system. This was a project understood to be a helicopter, a kind of bubble in which uh, in which you would reside. Uh, perhaps Smithson is the most famous um, uh, uh, in this context. In, in a 1972 text on Spiral Jetty, Smithson wrote, and I quote, for my film, a film is a spiral made up of frames. I would have myself filmed from a helicopter, from the Greek helix, helikos meaning spiral, was I but a shadow in a plastic bubble hovering in a place outside mind and body. Smithson first developed an interest in the helicopter in California, where their formation as a cultural technique in the operations of postmodernization were particularly uh, evident. Helicopters were points of intersection linking the aeronautics industry, transportation networks, Disneyland, real estate speculation, telejournalism, the film industry, and the academic disciplines of urban planning. Um, many folks were drawn into this airspace. Uh, if we take somebody like Ed Soja, for example, who was quite concerned with the role helicopters in particular had played in, um, in, in essentially substituting the lived riots in Los Angeles of 65 and 92 with, what, with hyper reality. Uh, he was also understanding that helicopters had been used by protesters in the street to locate where police activity uh, took place. So the very critique of the helicopter took place by virtue of the helicopter. Charles Jenks, uh, also working in California at the time, ultimately came uh, to argue that architectural icons were designed not for people or for cameras, but in fact for helicopters. It's hard not to think of Iwan Bon having picked up that idea uh, since uh, Iwan and helicopters are a kind of single unit uh, looking at architecture on Instagram uh, today. Uh, before Jenks or Soja arrived in Los Angeles or took up faculty positions at UCLA, there was Denise Scott Brown, who spent the 65-66 academic year teaching urban planning and moving around in helicopters. She spent a huge amount of time in them, as is as is attested to by the remarkable number of utterly prosaic receipts and ticket stubs for helicopter rides floating around in her paperwork. She seems to have used them more or less indiscriminately for transportation, for research, for teaching, uh, for networking, for entertainment. So even in their, uh, let's say, professional development sense, uh, the helicopter here was always working in a kind of ill-defined overlapping sense. Uh, except that she always had a camera. And indeed, despite the dramatic clarity of the relatively small handful of these photographs that have been widely reproduced, most of the images in her photographic corpus look like this one, substantially made of epistemologically vague helicopter images, images taken from airspace that offers neither the logic of the close and granular view from the ground, nor the omnipotent and totalizing view typical of aerial imaging. The images instead show middle distance views without singularities or panoramas, often hazy and unbounded. They don't reward aesthetic contemplation, but rather seek, often without success, to locate patterns in the cultivation of urban fields below. The world often appears at a tipped axonometric angle, neither tactile nor close, nor optical and distant, seen with what Regal might have called normal sight, and revealing an almost circumstantial negotiation between subject and object, purpose and accident. The corpus documents 
a process of becoming familiar with, acclimatizing to a new kind of hybrid environment. You know, I'm a little, um, I'm becoming slightly obsessed with the three-quarter view that you see in a lot of the helicopter views, this one being one of them. And I'm interested in the relationship between the dominance of the axonometric view in architectural uh, representation of this period and the helicopter. So uh, Cedric Price, a, a good touchstone for this kind of thinking. Um, you know, he had the best way of making axons, which is with a mirror over uh, uh, over a poster, creating this three-quarter view. Um, you know, we, we, you just might track the axonometric in relation to this question. Ed Boucher, for those of you who have seen the show, you saw uh, some of this work there, was also, if more famously, in a helicopter in 1965. Um, now, Boucher is typically understood to be Scott Brown's model. He the originator and she the appropriator of the helicopter as research tool. But the ubiquity of the helicopter throws not just this standard masculinist genealogy of originals into question, uh, but it, and the, as well as the models of authorship uh, for that derive from from it, but it avoids the increasingly uh, complex set of complexes to which the helicopter was both subject and object, and that drew people like Rouchet into it. Indeed, it is useful to consider the impact of helicoptering on Rouchet rather than to focus only on his use of the helicopter. So, for so for example, uh, flying around, um, uh, Rouchet turned into uh, uh, his opposite, if you will, is a kind of Dr. Jack and Mr. Hyde moment, he gets up into the air and looks down at patterns of land in the desert and starts to buy up property. Um, he buys up property and then develops a house, which gets a lot of uh, press and uh, in sort of fashion uh, magazines uh, like this. Uh, and he pulls it together, not just pulling it together, but he hires an architect uh, by the name of Frank Gehry um, as he becomes a real estate speculator. Of course, the aerial perspective was not new to real estate speculation, but the involution of critique and engagement was newly encouraged by the medial thickness of helicopter space. Perhaps no better example of the way it, uh, of this is the way in which the 10-mile stretch of Northern California coastline became Sea Ranch on the basis of speculative flight. Still defined as postmodernity's monument to anti-development, Sea Ranch was one of the largest developments in the Western United States, uh, predicated on land use regulations considered so restrictive that they triggered lawsuits altering sea access rights for the entire length of the state. The normal view created that, you know, so the art, guys are flying around, they, they go, oh, look at this 10 miles of beautiful land. And the impulse then is to purchase it, to develop it, to fill it with architecture, architecture that is full of the discourse of protecting the land. In other words, this is to say the conditions that normalized ambivalence uh, is what's happening here, enabling advertising, super graphics to act as details, mass-produced materials to profess locale, and an architectural culture to tolerate the fundamental contradiction between the excesses of development and the idea of stewardship of the land. Um, uh, this is a, you know, the Staffordshire super graphics come from billboard signage for highway for advertising, and then the architects incorporate this language to the design of the land itself. The land is an advertisement to be seen from the air. Trains and typewriters belong to a well-studied array of equipment rendered coherent through the values of speed, power, and abstraction fundamental to the processes of post of modernization. Helicopters and a not yet fully studied array of other medial apparatus from supply chains to design covenants to zipitone, none particularly fast, original or heroic, most originating in the military, but also deeply embedded, even invisibly, in cultural production and critique, undergird the processes of postmodernization. An epistemic uh, analog to the medial effects of the helicopter, for example, of the way in which its slow-moving ubiquity forged relays between the ground, a war, and a work of art, can also be seen in the teaching materials Scott Brown assembled during her year. 
she she taught this uh, studio uh, uh, once for a year, and it's a hundred pages long and fill, filled with an extraordinary amount of stuff. The students were asked to do a crazy amount of uh, different kinds of uh, research. Uh, it's interdisciplinary in the extreme. It's she sort of published it to the students along with these crazy annotations. She had like twenty five people come in and read the syllabus and make annotations. Some of them are quite tough, quite brutal um, in her inability to understand, about her inability to understand underlying uh, political and economic systems in urbanization. Uh, for me, like the, the most extraordinary thing is that she left it like this as she handed it uh, to, the, to the students, a kind of tolerance for ambivalence uh, that would soon uh, disappear. This is all to say that her syllabus, like her helicopter images, operated as and within a cultural infrastructure that connected different kinds of things in a dynamic and unpredictable system, an environmental infrastructure of information dependent on multiplying linkages between air and ground persons and machines. The peculiar and entangling media ecology of helicopter airspace continued to produce unexpected pathways of connections well past 65. In 1977, a U.S. airway helicopter fell off the roof of the Pan Am building below, killing five and creating what the New York Post called the war zone on the streets below. Richard Donner, who directed the first Superman movie in 1978, saw in the catastrophe an opportunity to rewrite history and give postmodern historicism its first redemptive hero. Richard Serra also so saw this uh, these five deaths as an opportunity and called on the helicopters to become his new transport system for his large steel plates. 1984, however, the year Apple Macintosh triggered the proliferation of per, uh, personal computers, uh, was the helicopter's biggest year. That was the year MoMA acquired the Bell, removing it from flight in order to present it as if in flight, and the year Jameson claimed that in the helicopter, something, and I quote, something of the new mystery of the postmodernist space um, is concentrated. I guess I'm trying to suggest, however, that for the helicopter, space is not mysterious or an abstraction. Space is the air it breathes, air located between the surface of the earth and 10,000 feet above, air also breathed by all terrestrial organisms, air being conditioned and redesigned, not only by changes in biomass, in carbon and other toxic outputs, but by the waves, pulses, temperatures and material inflections of information infrastructures that too live on and in the air. In other words, as seminal as Jameson's theorization remains, um, uh, the, the effect of helicopter operations was not the production of a concentrated and therefore containable space. In fact, we could suggest that the obsessive language games played by critics during this time uh, 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 were really attempts to control the uncontrollable by imposing language structure on what had become elemental conditions. By 1984, the 19th century aerial appearance of telegraphs, panoramas, had been joined by telephones, radio, VHF, UHF, cellular telephony, L-band, C-band, S-band, and K-band, each of which required more elements and energies all moving through this airspace, changing its temperature, its chemical composition, its density. To helicopter was to hover, to reside, and breathe in information. Leo Steinberg, in a famous essay of 68 on the flat bed picture plane, described the media mediating effect of information on the naturalism of painting and said that the subjects of these effects would from now on merely turn a knob indoors in order to know the temperature outdoors. 
But the effects of this information development were more elemental than that. They eroded the distinction between inside and outside because knobs and joysticks were not only distancing abstractions, but components of a material network that pervaded the breathable atmosphere of the Earth. So to conclude with the helicopter's big moment in 1984, over 100 helicopters hovered over Los Angeles uh, during the LA Olympics, creating both the largest security system ever used in peacetime and the largest media event ever televised live. During the closing ceremony, a large military helicopter flew over the Coliseum. It was invisible to the audience. Below, painted black, lights turned off. Even the sound of its rotors was camouflaged by two civilian helicopters escorting it on either side. Uh, uh, this was a helicopter to helicoptering complex, and it carried not Christ, but a spaceship. Suspending it in midair over the Coliseum crowd were sending light and sound signals to the audience that had been provided with flashlights with which to respond and engaged in an intraspecies communication spectacle. The helicopter's starring role as signifier was the concluding performance in what had started as a temporary urban internet, a complex of electronic security badges, computer-linked traffic and communication systems, and a kit of parts of total design strategy that included costumes, pavilions, street signs, printed matter, and logos that eventually spread across the entire city, elements of which became permanent parts of the city's infrastructure. Some nodes in this dynamic network were visible, others invisible, but breathing the air of this space was not a choice. Approximately 8 million people lived in Los Angeles in 1984, and 2.5 billion people watched the event live. Approximately 94.2% of the people born in 1984 are still alive today. Who among us has not been postmodernized? Thank you. Thank you so much, Sylvia, for this theory of postmodernity through its devices and technological shifts. Um, there could not be a better follow up than Reinhold Martin, who is um, a leading and much inspiring thinker of power analyzing power and its shifts through build space and also media and technology. Um, Reinhold Martin is co-founder of the journal Grey Room. Um, he's professor at the architecture of the Graduate School, uh, Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation at Columbia University. And his really influential publications include the Organiz Organizational Complex, which I know the artist Noah Barker is a big fan of. That's why he's also invited to give a feedback and respondents. Knowledge Worlds, Media materiali Materiality and the Making of the Modern University. And Utopia's Ghost, Architecture and Postmodernism, again, which was very um, formative for conceptualizing our show, for example, um, contrasting the Union Carbide headquarters by Kevin Roche in Connecticut with the Bhopal catastrophe uh, in India in 1984 um, and reading individuation on one side, hyper-individuation and uh, the exposure of bare life, uncounted lives to death on the other side. Um, this is one of the uh, less cheerful exhibits in the show. Reinhold, thank you so much for the conversation we shared and thank you for explaining the intricate um, relationship between postmodernism and conservatism, which we actually now at the moment see again in recent assaults on postmodernism, but they can also seem like restagings of historical plays playing out again. Reinhold, thank you. All right. Good. Okay. Well, Thank you. Thank you, Kolya. Uh, and I, first of all, congratulations to everybody on this amazing show. And we um, insist that after all of this, go back into the show and see the actual postmodernism there. Um, so, so yes, thanks to Kolya, to Eva, and also, of course, to Sylvia uh, and to Noah for this, you know, kind of uh, conversation. 
uh, that we, uh, I suppose, is imminent, uh, and I will do my best to contribute. It'll be interesting to see what dots we can connect. Um, but uh, in, in, the, in the spirit of, of a kind of another kind of conversation, I actually want to dedicate um, this talk, my talk, to uh, a mutual friend um, in remembrance, uh, Tony Vidler, uh, Anthony Vidler, the architectural historian who recently passed away. Um, what I'm going to speak about actually is what remains of a now, un now uh, sadly, permanently unfinished conversation with Tony, um, begun actually not too long ago. So, uh, here we go. Permit me, uh, if you will, to begin with a sort of longish quotation, sorry. Uh, I promise, though, that this will be the last. Um, it says, students at European schools of architecture are no longer taught the grammar of the classical orders. They're no longer taught to understand moldings, to draw existing monuments, urban streets, the human figure, or such vital aesthetic phenomena as the fall of light on a Corinthian capital or the shadow of a campanile on a sloping roof. Uh, they are no longer taught facades, cornices, doorways, or anything else that could be gleaned from a study of the great classical treatises of Serlio and Palladio. The new curriculum has been designed to produce ideologically driven engineers whose representational skills would go no further than ground plans and isometric drawings uh, and who would be able to undertake the gargantuan projects of the socialist state. Shoveling people into housing estates, laying out industrial areas and business parks, driving highways uh, through ancient city centers, and generally reminding the middle classes that Big Brother is overlooking them and that they are no longer in charge. Now, uh, all that is changing. So as you can see, these are the words of the British aesthetic and political philosopher Roger Scruton, uh, published in, in 2016. So now all that is changing was 2016 in an essay celebrating the work of the Luxembourgian uh, architect Leon Creer. And in, as we know, things were indeed changing in 2016 on both sides of the Atlantic. Scruton would surely have count, uh, counted the kitsch resorts, golf clubs, and speculative office buildings strewn about during the preceding decades by the real estate developer who was elected to the U.S. presidency uh, as, uh, that year as akin uh, to the vandalism, as he called it, uh, perpetuated by modernist architects and planners. Nevertheless, uh, this same U.S. president, uh, four years later, and having already been electorally deposed, so this is in late 2022, um, would sign Executive Order 13967, promoting beautiful federal civic architecture, the original title of which said it all, Make Federal Buildings Beautiful Again. The, yeah, sorry. Uh, the, the order, this is real. The, the order uh, which required all new federal buildings, um, and especially those in Washington, D.C., uh, to be designed in a classical manner was drafted by the National Civic Arts Society, a private group led by Justin Shubo, who, who, uh, whom uh, the emperor of Mar-a-Lago uh, had appointed to the U.S. Commission of Fine Arts in 2018, and who now serves on the advisory board for the Roger Scruton Legacy Foundation. So this connects those dots. Right? Scruton, uh, whose funeral in 2020 was attended by his longtime friend, Viktor Orban, uh, alongside other sort of lesser luminaries of the Nationalist International, was among the leading counter-revolutionary intellectuals of the late 20th century and the early 21st. His uh, 1979 treatise, The Aesthetics of Architecture, was also among a vanishingly small number of philosophical works of the period to treat architecture seriously and systematically. This is an actual work of aesthetic philosophy about architecture. There's so few of them, you can, you know, it, it really bears noticing. Um, 
So these two facts are related, right? The, 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 the presence of Orban uh, and other nationalists at, at Scruton's funeral and, and this treatise. Architecture was, for Scruton, a public art dedicated to the edification of collective taste through a form of aristocratic populist Bildung, uh, exemplified in his enthusiasm for Creer's urbanism as well as his buildings. The street, conceived as an orderly arrangement of, fa of facades, preferably classical, uh, was the arena in which aesthetic rightness was to be exhibited and experienced. An inveterate culture warrior, Scruton saw the non-representational arts of architecture and music as a means thereby to correct, uh, through intellectually mediated aesthetic training, the excesses of left-wing politics, socialist planning, and critical theory. On the latter, on critical theory in particular, he expounded in detail in another book from the same period. Um, these are all worth reading, I must say. Thinkers of the New Left from 1985, uh, which collected his uh, critical essays from the Salisbury Review uh, and was updated and reissued in 2015 under this beautiful title, Fools, Frauds, and Firebrands. So these are all our friends. Um, Scruton, uh, himself a product of the English working class, uh, dated his own political awakening to May 1968 in Paris, what he called the most beautiful city in the world, when he observed, quote, these wretched spoiled brats trying to pull it all down. His most systematic work of political philosophy, uh, The Meaning of Conservatism, dates from 1980, uh, uh, a year after his treatise on architecture. So these are all clustered together. Um, <clears throat> philosophically, his political classicism, because that's what, what this is, is Straussian uh, only in its emphasis on the city or polis as the site of, of political life. This is not, in other words, the postmodernist so-called neoconservatism uh, with, with its abandonment of big narratives that so worried Jürgen Habermas during this same period. Nor is it the end of history triumph of neoliberalism that you can see in the show as you exit um, that Francis Fuk Fukuyama uh, would celebrate a decade later. This is the real thing. A serious political philosophy of the right, and perhaps even the far right, laced with straightforward, straightforward Islamophobia uh, that led Scruton infamously to complain toward the end of his life of the, quote, sudden invasion of huge tribes of Muslims, end quote, in Hungary, a country run, in his view, uh, by what he called, quote, the Soros Empire, of anti-nationalist cosmopolitan Jews, comments for which he was accused of anti-Semitism and removed from his position as housing advisor to Theresa May's Building Better, Building, Building Beautiful Commission in the UK uh, in April 2019. I should say that Scruton uh, defended himself against these accusations. I'm not here to engage in, in the kind of mud, mudslinging that he so enjoyed, because if you read these books about uh, you know, critical theory, he did enjoy this, um, when it came to philosophers of the left. Rather, I want to explain how Scruton's thought, his actual philosophy, uh, enables us to recognize in architecture uh, a counter-revolutionary program that long ago joined forces with a political project with which we should be genuinely concerned. Now, Creer, uh, Leon Creer, for his part, was and remains an architectural purist who does not shy away from political speech, uh, despite the disingenuous commitment of his the disingenuous to, commitment to artistic autonomy that led him to publish a, publish a notorious monograph, Albert Speer, Architecture, in uh, in 1985, which was reissued with uh, a defensive foreword by Robert A. M. Stern in 2013. 
Reviewing the book when it first appeared, the historian of Nazi architecture, Barbara Miller Lane, uh, described it in postmodernist language as a pastiche. That's what, how Miller Lane describes the book, um, <clears throat> of previously published material mixed with fragments of Creer's own discourse. Creer himself uh, disavowed any too easy equation between Speer's monumental neoclassical architecture uh, and the political ideology that it served. Even so, in an essay provocatively titled An Architecture of Desire that he appended to the Speer material, Creer manages to turn on its head the feminist anti-fascism of Klaus Tevelite, whom he cites, he actually cites Klaus Tevelite in this essay, by recasting the mechanized male fantasies, that's Tevelite's term, um, inventoried by Tevelite as expressions of, he, so Speer re recasts these as expressions of legitimate collective desire that had been merely thwarted or, as he says, humiliated and frustrated uh, by industrialization rather than as manifestations of the will to power itself. Um, in a passage, by the way, that's conspicuously absent from the re-edited version of the essay uh, that prefaces the new edition. There's a lot of publication and republication. This is another form of pastiche, but uh, in Creer's uh, discourse. Thus, Creer sought implicitly to redeem Speer's aestheticization of politics by distinguishing it from his role as Hitler's minister of armaments and war production. So he was okay with the aestheticization of politics. He was, he, he, he was more uncomfortable with industrialization. The book's centerpiece is a portfolio of Speer's work headed by a lavish presentation of Speer's grandiose plan for Greater Berlin. Uh, and only here does Creer's pastiche of Speer uh, come into coherent focus. In 1983, two years before the Speer book, uh, book's original publication, the Museum of Modern Art Architecture curator Arthur Drexler uh, had commissioned Creer to produce a hypothetical master plan for the completion of Washington, D.C. So there are, there's this whole sequence of master plans that I'm going to show you uh, that articulates, that makes some sense of the Speer uh, republication. Um, so this is an anticipation of the bicentennial of the city's founding. Uh, this plan, in turn, follows from another counter plan of about a decade earlier, this time for the city of Luxembourg, um, which was at the time uh, in competition with Brussels to host the institutions of the European Union. Seen within this sequence, Creer's appropriation of Speer's plan for Berlin appears as what another of his interlocutors, Rem Kulhas, uh, called a retroactive manifesto. Though not in this case for financial capitalism, but for Heimatschutz, uh, or homeland security, homeland protection, homeland security. So here's Creer describing his counter plan for Washington, D.C. Here's the plan. Um, defending, he quote, this is uh, Creer. Defending our land and values again against its foes and building great houses, palaces, and cities are all equally noble patriotic deeds and duties. A homeland is not just made of people and their history, but of all the things uh, that our eyes can see that our senses will embrace. If we cannot love them, if they do not inflame our hearts, they will lead us to hate ourselves and our fellow citizens. And then, quote, the supreme purpose of the architect is to build and maintain the homeland. End quote. So... Is the homeland. Um, as in, so as in uh, Speer's Architecture of Desire, the purpose of recovering the classical ideal is therefore above all to inspire love. Uh, in both Creer's and Speer's designs for capital cities with their overtones of imperial Rome, here's Creer, um, this crystallizes into a chilling, emotive nationalism that builds and maintains the homeland, not only in the streets, uh, but the, in the, as it were, inflamed hearts of citizens. What may look like just another postmodern game played with the classical language is therefore deadly serious. Far from indulging in a vacuous exchange of surface effects, Creer, with, with Speer's help, plunges a sharpened Corinthian column into the depths of the soul. So this is a comparative chart of columns that he includes in, in um, the Schwer book, and this is the, 
a column from the Grosse Halle in, uh, in the Berlin plan. So, so Creer plunges a sharpened Corinthian column into the depths of the soul. Classicism here, then, is more than style. As Creer explains elsewhere, uh, the effort to recover meaning in defense of the homeland regards all forms of traditional or neo-traditional architecture and urbanism as classical, including work as diverse as the elite populism of Hassan Fati and the parsimoniousness of Henry Bacon's Lincoln Memorial. So it's not just classical. There's no contradiction, then, in the artisanal, medieval, artisanal medievalism of the plan for Luxembourg. Um, here, the, count, the counter project, uh, you see it above, that's clear, is designed in opposition to the modernist master plan below, pro proposed by Josef Vago for Luxembourg and the competition among European capitals for the EU headquarters. Creer places the visual and verbal emphasis on materials. This is to be a city of stone, as he called it, lovingly rendered as a pan-European homeland, in stark contrast with an alienating city of steel and glass, populated, we must assume, by cosmopolitan bureaucrats, uh, busy opening Europe's borders to a post-colonial workforce admitted to build and maintain the end of history, in the form of the post-industrial utopia that Creer so despises. Like his recovery of Speer's imperial capital, but now less wishful, Creer's early, this early counterproject for a new European homeland uh, is, a, is a project for a Europe uh, for the Europeans. As the drawings say without saying, this is important, they say this without saying, this homeland is to be built by Ruskinian stonemasons handing down their craft through secure bloodlines and living in the plan's distinct quarters, so this, these are the quarters, uh, what Creer refers to as cities within cities, rather than, this is to be built by these, these stonemasons, rather than by unskilled migrant workers from, from former colonies, mixing with anonymous European masses in the streets and living in modernist social housing in the city's outs outskirts. So if this interpretation uh, of, as, as basically this Europe for the Europeans uh, kind of nationalism is, uh, if this seems to you tendentious, uh, I will add one more detail before moving on to another uh, and ultimately final example from Washington, D.C. Independently of his fascination with Speer's idiom, Creer wrote in 2009 of classical and vernacular architecture that, quote, typological experiments, genetic idiosyncrasies, and crossbreeds cannot reproduce. The principle of life means growth until maturity, reproduction according to type and species stability. Classicism assumes the same to be true for artistic creation. So in case the racialized me message about infertile crossbreeds doesn't come through, a diagram uh, published at least twice helpfully explains Creer's logic as follows. Pluralism, it's in, in, as such, is not a problem as long as everybody stays where they belong, in the, in the city within a city to which they belong. Problems only arise with miscegenation, when racial mixing destroys the bloodlines and prevents the reproduction of types, architectural and otherwise. So, I mean, you know. Returning to Scruton, uh, it's important that none of this is explicit. Or, well, I mean, this is pretty explicit, but um, as a non-representational art, this is the kind of key part of Scruton's theory. Uh, Scruton argues in, in Kantian fashion, architecture's meaning is conveyed through, a, through an interplay of intellect and experience rather than through a system of signs. So this is not semiotics. Thus, understanding architecture in such a ma uh, is not a matter of semantic decoding, but of cultivated, tasteful appreciation. It doesn't matter whether Creer uh, comprehends any of this. It doesn't, you know, his, his, carefully, his own carefully curated persona is of an architect savant, a kind of man-child who draws a lot uh, and who dedicates his books to Charles III, uh, Mon Prince, as he lovingly, lovingly puts it, my prince, uh, <coughs> royal patron of Poundbury outside of Dorset, uh, another career design counterproject that has actually, in this case, been built. Um, this is the site plan of Poundbury. Uh, so from Berlin to Luxembourg to Washington to Poundbury, what matters is not the message, but the inarticulate lines of descent. 
In all of these counter projects, the pedestrian street is an edifying place rather than an alienating space, where citizens gather to share experiences and tastes cultivated through both the fine and popular arts. This is the street politics of the Nationalist International, which stretches also to Budapest and Prague, where Scruton worked with dissidents behind the Iron Curtain, and from there again to Washington, D.C., uh, reborn in Creer's imagination as an architect's late Cold War version of Ronald Reagan's shining city on a hill, as he called it, Reagan. Uh, it, it is a politics far more militant, this is a militant politics, this is you know, kind of the main point, uh, that the, than the ambivalent relativism of the Strada Novissima, the centerpiece uh, of the uh, 1980 Venice Biennale, uh, to which Creer contributed a facade there. For, as I've been arguing, the philosophical anguish that this kind of deformed uh, Benjaminian arcade provoked in the likes of Habermas, Habermas kind of, you know, he, he notoriously visited this and then started writing about postmodernism. Um, uh, the kind of anguish that this provoked in, in the likes of Habermas was justified only insofar as neoliberal anti-historicism was the only specter haunting Europe and with it, uh, uh, the postmodern world system. But it was not. There were other specters. Also stalking those streets was the homeland, the love of which can kill. As we also know, this inflamed love can direct its hatred most viciously at its very object of desire. Uh, in an iconoclasm uh, that resacralizes its monuments by subjecting them to ritual, ritual destruction, followed in untimely fashion by vitalist rebirth. Rebirth. Um, so not long after the stage set architecture of the Strada Novissima premiered, another stage was set for real political theater at Foggy Bottom, a mid-century office building in Washington, D.C., where the United States Department of State is headquartered. There, in 1983, the South African-born American architect, Alan Greenberg, designed a set of reception rooms. So this is my concluding example for you. A set of reception rooms and offices for the Secretary of State and his deputy, um, known as the Treaty Ceremony Suite, or Treaty Rooms, as well as a large conference room, the Secretary of State's Office and Study, and a gallery with associated foyers. For this uh, commission, Greenberg, whose architecture is more strictly neoclassical than Creer's, developed a variation on the Corinthian and Ionic orders adapted to the task of framing state diplomacy. Called the Great Seal Order, there you have it, uh, Greenberg's contribution to the classical canon superimposed the eagle and flag motif of the Great Seal of, U of the United States on the traditional acanthus leaves or scrolls of the, in the capitals of the columns and pilasters that lined the rooms. Corinthian uh, for the treaty room and for the secretary, Ionic for the deputy. Here, there you see the Corinthian pilasters. Greenberg's patron on the project was President Ronald Reagan's sec second sec Secretary of State, George P. Schultz, um, <clears throat> who, uh, Greenberg reports, requested that his own office, quote, ha uh, have the character of rooms in which Thomas Jefferson, the first Secretary of State, would feel at home while also sensing that something new had happened. Uh, in return, in his foreword to uh, Greenberg's historical review of American neoclassicism, the Greenberg also wrote a book uh, titled The Architecture of Democracy, of all things, uh, in 2006. <clears throat> uh, Schultz was full of praise for Greenberg's contribution to the Reagan administration. Quote, this is secretary, former secretary now, George Schultz. Quote, the result was a heart-lifting space uh, that recalls American history's finest moments and inspires occupants and visitors alike to lift their sights and prove themselves worthy of the setting. End quote. Though what it may, means, you know, for a visiting diplomat, diplomat to feel worthy of this setting remains unclear, the, se the sense overall is clear enough. Polit political kitsch, uh, eagle emblazoned Corinthian columns, amplified by the cliche of a heart-lifting space to in imp inspire postmodern bureaucrats to lofty aims, uh, is nationalist theater. Less obvious is how this combines, as with Scruton, with an assault on the social democratic state and on, the ra on, and on its racialized beneficiary, beneficiaries, whom Reagan's earlier presidential campaign had stereotyped as welfare queens. This is another Reaganism, welfare queens. 
Greenberg's uh, Great Seal Order um, refers directly to Benjamin Latrobe's substitution of the Corinthian acanthus with corn husks and tobacco, tobacco leaves in column capitals in the rebuilt capital building in 1817, a dramatic instance of the practice of editing the orders common since the 18th century. But in the case of the U.S. State Department rooms, as with the so-called new classicism more broadly, architecture's seeming dialogue with itself uh, extends into a confrontation with the modernist building in which it was housed. So this is the building in which those rooms were built. Um, completed in 1961 by Graham Anderson Propston White. A stylized, low-slung composition of somber massing with a smooth stone interior, repetitive square windows, stripped-down detailing, and a colonnaded base. This ensemble uh, served as a backdrop against which Greenberg uh, worked. The resulting montage of classical appointments recalls the period rooms that had by then become ubiquitous receptacles for the country's self-fashioned heritage. Um, as if in a Max Ernst collage, these new interiors were cut into a textbook example, the, the, the modernist building, of what Henry Russell Hitchcock had earlier called an architecture of bureaucracy, in an inadvertent surrealism that mimicked the rhetorical triumphs of Reaganism. The pseudo-grandeur pseudo of the post-68 return to order was captured in Reagan's Hollywood-style mixture of populism with faux classical oratory, where neo-royalist pageantry played against Weberian bureaucracy as the new language of the state. In the reciprocal surrealism of the treaty rooms, with their great seal order, stood a monstrously embellished parody of classical harmony repackaged as what Reagan ominously called in a 1984 television commercial, Morning in America. Now, to understand more fully how this new classicism worked against an architecture of bureaucracy, we must accept Creer's admonition that classicism is not a style and recognize its rebirth as an ideological program devoted to the making of effectively tacit meaning. In his 1979 treatise on architecture, Scruton compares two forks. So this is Scruton's philosophical text. One on the, uh, on the left, obviously, of Swedish modernist design, the other generically neoclassical. And argues, uh, Scruton argues that the traditional fork, proportioned like a classical column with base, middle, and top, is both more aesthetically sound and more functional, corresponding as it does to a naturally leisured lifestyle. From there, it follows that Scandinavian forks and modernist planning are of a piece. Scoffing at the Swedish forks' aestheticized utilitarianism, Scruton is able, by a syllogistic sleight of hand, to dismiss the entire European welfare state and its socialist extrapolations, not on political or economic grounds, but on aesthetic grounds. This strategy of contrasts is borrowed from A.W.N. Pugin and uh, as a reliable technique for equating art with morality. In late 2020, it was employed quite effectively by the National Civic Art Society, the Scrutonian authors of Executive Order 13967, promoting beautiful federal civic architecture, which the outgoing U.S. president signed during the same weeks that he and his advisors plotted to overturn electoral defeat. What may appear as mere shameless opportunism, a last-ditch effort on behalf of the civic arts, coheres with the ferocious politics of making America great again when we consider a more sober document titled Americans' Preferred Architecture for Federal Buildings. This is this one. Uh, a report issued by the NCAS just as the organization was agitating for the executive order. They basically helped to write the executive order. Um, the heavily illustrated pamphlet summarizes the results of an online survey in which 2,039 respondents indicated their preferences uh, among each of seven pairs, so this is the sort of pairing again, um, of government buildings, one traditional and mostly neoclassical uh, and other modern. The results, of course, bipartisan support for traditional architecture across the board. But just as Scruton's Swedish fork spoke without words of social democracy and his neoclassical fork of aristocratic populism, the NCAS authors concealed an unspoken question in their contrasting images. Which of these looks more like the architecture of indecent welfare and of the deep state, as they called it, 
Uh, it's not the language they're using in the report, but we recognize the language. Uh, which of these, these look like the architecture of indecent welfare in the deep state and which of pious wealth and power? As Roger Scruton persuasively argued, architecture is a non-representational art. A poor medium for explicit messaging, it excels in conveying meaning without words. Scruton called such nonverbal non meaning rightness, recognizable to the educated eye. This silent intelligibility has proved especially useful to those who, like Leon Creer and the ideologues at the NCAS, uh, have sought plausible deniability for their art's darkest and most odious allegiances, past and present. For these are the street fighters of the culture wars, who may soon uh, control the aesthetic battlefield should we allow ourselves to remain distracted too long by postmodernism's little games. Thank you. Thank you so much, Reinhold. Without further distraction, I would like to uh, invite you to the panel together with Sylvia and with Noah Barker, who is um, um, a subtle, precise writer, uh, sometimes for Texte zur Kunst, for example, artist, um, for example, with his work Toy Machine, um, applying the color code, the legendary color code of Centre Pompidou to the infrastructure of the exhibition space wherever it is uh, executed. But most of all, Noah is an obsessive reader. So uh, we put huge trust in him uh, of challenging Sylvia's and Reinhold's um, lectures um, from the perspective of somebody born uh, after 1989. Please, the floor is yours. No. Applause. Where do you want to say? You should sit in the middle, no? I don't know. What do you want to do? Yeah, whatever, I mean. Uh, so. Okay. Well. Is this on? It's, uh, thank you for the presentations, Reinhold and Sylvia, and for uh, everyone for hosting the event. Uh, I guess this is difficult to try and integrate the two <laughs> ideas of postmodernism, but I believe at the beginning of uh, for Jameson's uh, kind of treatise on the subject, uh, he, he does describe two various forms of postmodernism, a liberatory one embedded within the post-structural project and the death of the author, as well as a more reactionary current. Um, on the one hand, I see the helicopter uh, being embodied within the spirit of the talk and its interdisciplinary flyover of the kind of territory of the 20th century, interlinking various systems incongruencies in the same way that the uh, photographs that you showed from uh, Brown. And on the other, I can see this uh, specter of the reactionary, uh, let's call it hyper, or rather than hyper postmodern, maybe late postmodern. Uh, and I think of then late modern, late modernism as a kind of uh, cultural practice that was happening in the 60s and 70s when Jameson was kind of formulating um, this text that, of course, came out as a book in the 80s, but is earlier published in the New Left Review as a kind of preliminary essay. Uh, responding to Ernest Mandel, the uh, Marxist uh, economist, analysis of late capitalism and his 1972 kind of prescient understanding of the, the collapse and distress of the post-war agreement of uh, you know, more or less the U.S. supporting Germany and Japanese reconstruction as kind of hubs of regional development that then contested an American a hegemony in the in the overproductive capacity of these uh, new economies, right? And so within that schema, there's like the emergence of the computer and the bomb, maybe most clearly, but alongside them, these techniques and technologies of war that have to be fully integrated into the kind of every day. And that's the anxiety that's being, you know, maybe expressed uh, with, with the, the presence of the helicopter. You know, just to get from JFK to Manhattan, 
concurrent with uh, the maybe like uh, getting from Saigon into some deeper element of the of the kind of uh, yeah the forest there. Um, so uh, I guess a bit further, I'd say um, that this economic model that was kind of distressed. Uh, I wonder if there's a, maybe I'll open now a question up to Reinhold. Is there some elements of this, uh, let's say, a zombie uh, neoliberal project that seems to, at least since 2008, been seeing uh, emerging a, a new crisis that I think Trump, who you brought up repeatedly, was maybe had his most lasting impact, not culturally, which I think uh, I would disagree the, the extent to which the, 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 the rioters at the, the Capitol building were an expression of a new, more dangerous right, so much as a kind of like repressed, bubbling undercurrent of this, this uh, populist kind of like moment that the, the, he, he targets China, right, a lot. And there's a kind of onshoring, uh, re-onshoring uh, implication, his kind of like economic response. Mm -hmm. I don't know, is this, uh, do you see a kind of, in this celebration of Americana, mm -hmm. is, is it, would, you, would you tie that to some economic kind of? You mean like protectionism and yeah. that type of thing? The, the bureaucrats now feel a kind of embodied, uh, spirit to, to perform the tasks. I, I, I don't know, so, so, something I like, like to do is go to presidential libraries and in them there's often like a refabrication of a president's uh, chair or yes. the Oval Office. <laughs> and, uh, and you get a, a, a sense of what it feels like to be in charge and maybe these bureaucrats are, uh, I don't know, yeah. being, yeah. I don't know, I mean, I'll try to, I also try to connect a few uh -huh. thoughts uh, uh -huh. in trying to respond and then you know, hang over to Sylvia. But um, it seems to me that, okay, if you want to, we can begin with the Jameson mm -hmm. essay. Mm -hmm. There is a reference to China in that mm. essay. There's a, there's a poet, I forget now the poet's name, is a California poet who writes a poem about Chinatown in, mm. I think, in San Francisco. And, uh, and so there is... And another, an important dimension of of the, the perspective. This is something that I've found myself returning to in teaching some of this material. In Jameson, is is, is a, in the background is a kind of world systems idea that that uh, you know uh, uh, w whatever we call it, like capitalism, neoliberal, etc., is is only really one aspect or one feature uh, of, a, of, a, of a larger system of which China in its, at the time, industrialization and, and then eventually at this point, um, you know, uh, economic rise uh, would be, it would be another aspect, another expression. Um, so I think it's kind of, these things are, have been there since the beginning. Um, one of his, the other interlocutors for someone like Jameson is Giovanni Arrighi, who is an actual world systems political economist. And, um, and so there, anyway, the, who wrote the, later a book, Adam, Adam Smith in Beijing, uh, about basically from, from the other side, uh, what the world system looked like in the early 2000s. Um, but in any case, uh, on the helicopters, so... <laughs> There's, there's the apocalypse now aspect of this too, right? That, that I, I, I take that to be, you know, kind of right in the background. Uh, and, and Vietnam, because that's the way that Jameson, he refers to Michael Herr's book, Dispatches, which is about, you know, it's war journalism. And he's like in the helicopter and with the troops. You know. So it, it does seem to me something about a place, I mean, you know, the, 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 in the U.S. at least, uh, a real difficulty in coming to terms with the, with the Vietnam War and its consequences at home and, of course, you know, in Vietnam itself. Uh, and I, I kind of read the helicopter, you know, allegorically maybe a little bit in both directions. Is that fair? Yeah. Um, like Vietnam, I think basically. it's quite literal. I yeah, mean, it's literal. I don't know yeah. That it needs to be allegorical. Yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah. I, but I suppose it's also, I mean, in terms of the China Vietnam, there's a lot of offshoring 
going on yeah. um, during this period. But but here, maybe allegorically, I think that concern for, let's say, environmental issues was also offshore. To yeah, be, yeah. It was happening over there right. and not any place else. So I, I, I think that that's um, certainly part of the poll. Can, can I ask you a question? Sure. Um, Do that. We I, can just... <laughs> I'm I'm interested in this. I, you're, you're, you're thinking about architecture and love yeah. because it also comes up in your recent wonderful book uh, on university campuses. Yeah. Um, and uh, so t in today you were, were you suggesting that uh, the modes of communication of architecture good at implicit messaging rather than explicit messaging is does that make it particularly um, useful as a love object or as a love what do you yeah I don't know you know I don't know I mean it's an interesting conversation to have I, I, I and to think out loud a bit honestly about this um, in this case, I was really trying to to follow to stick with Scruton's philosophy. He doesn't really speak like that, but Creer does. So, you know, uh, about this very you know emotive Washington D.C. you know love object. But um, but I do think that there's there's something to this uh, uh, about that runs somewhat against the grain of the let's say the predominant postmodernist poststructuralist kind of emphasis on signification and and architecture and other forms of culture um you know basically as conveying uh meaning through messages and in this you know so what i'm trying to get at is to sort of take them at their word first of all and say yes in fact actually and it's mu in, for scrutiny he writes another book about music so it's music and architecture that are the non-representational arts that that are not necessarily by love i think i i'm this could probably bifurcate in a couple of different ways or in two different directions but but one where that would be, it would become very affective and very sort of emotional uh which the, the some of the classic uh understandings of of national socialist uh Art and uh, you know the sort of critique of of the aestheticization of politics, a la Benjamin, uh, referring to people like Speer, uh, is has to do with its emotive features and aspects, like Speer's the Nuremberg rallies, for example. Um, and but there's another more sober uh, element to this that's kind of Kantian, and they're going to do a show of, about Kant in this museum, uh, I believe in the coming months it'll be i want to come back for that um but uh kantian in the sense that mediated by intellect you know a little bit more to do with the categories that we use to understand uh sensory experience but nonetheless tacit or at least you know not verbal in the in the sign and signifier way so uh so i and i think that there is this is a, a tradition in aesthetics that is not as well developed in in, in kind of you know the culture that we're speaking with in and to probably here. Uh, it's very it's anglophone analytical aesthetics basically that that in a post Wittgensteinian Cambridge pretty much that that's where Scruton was um, that this this kind of thing is being developed. But so I, I think it it provides us with some leverage and it, get, it allows us to understand in this case how. They can say it without saying. So, you know. Uh huh. Interesting. <laughs> well, it does remind me, I mean, you had also mentioned the deep state, and uh, it reminded me of this, uh, the, I believe the largest uh, intelligence building in the world is actually in Germany. And, yeah. and uh, the, the move from the, the BND to, uh, to they, Berlin and by Clayhus and Clayhus. Oh, uh, Clayhus, okay. And, 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 and they, but they were. They talk about, and actually in the description of the building, the desire to hide uh, the the length of the facade with a series of kind of uh, like a labyrinthine uh, features. Uh, but it is a very harkens to a kind of international modernism in its in its ro roster facade. Um, and I just wonder, yeah, in a way, it returns to I guess in the I was thinking of the air and then the street. In a way, there was this again this. I can't help but see an epistemological uh, address within what the helicopter meant. And maybe you could speak, you, I know you didn't want to call it an allegory, 
but if you see, the, if you could see maybe more to, yeah, the difference between the train and its ability to transform economically the American, uh, the, 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 new, the new world uh, as this major financial project versus the helicopter as this kind of decentered signifier, uh, which you could then, you know, assess the postmodern world. Well, I will, I will try to answer that, but I, I actually want to say one other thing about love. Mm. Um, um, just because um, I'm, I'm interested in love and, and the misogyny, the, the problem of reproduction yeah, yeah. Uh, on, a, on a really basic level yeah. that you were describing, and to compare the kind of love rules, mm. let's say, that are implicit in the architecture that you're showing, as opposed to what we might call yeah. the love rules on display very in the gallery. Yeah. They're, ver they're <laughs> very, very different. Yeah. Um, I don't know whether the 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 um, elimination of, you know, what you would classically call desire in one, it, you know, whether that's what it is or whether it's just the normativity of what's allowed under one set of yeah. rules. Sure. Um, yeah. Anyway, I just yeah, thought, yeah. you know, just so so quite quite different than the than the uh, orgiastic love that is in display yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, there. Mm. Yeah, I mean the helicopter. Look, let me just say about the helicopter. I think that one of the, um, like a lot of people, I'm really trying to think how we think through historical issues in environmental terms, and air and sky and space is a subject of a huge amount of historical metaphorization. And a lot of scholars are actually trying to think of it as a place that has chemical, uh, you know, um, it has physical properties, chemical properties that engages with things in material ways. Um, one of the things that I continue to find fascinating about the way postmodernism is bracketed off is that there's very little sense of where um, the environmental episteme that had been developing since the 1940s, at least in the United States, um, where it went, right? So it was an active cultural problem in the 50s and uh, up until the middle 60s. And then I think it goes to Vietnam. I mean, I think it goes away. And then there's no way to think about it again until really very recently. So um, I... I think uh, I, I think that the helicopter is a way to try to begin to think about. It, it, clearly, unlike the train, it's not only about let's say increasing and facilitating the industrial production of goods. It's an informatic uh, device making making links of uh, all all kinds, but it too had material properties. Um, and just trying to think about what those might be, where they had their impact, um, where those impacts were sublimated, where they were offshored, um, is is part of what I think uh, postmodernization requires us to think about in in global and environmental terms. L mm -hmm. Long answer, but that's yeah. I think, yeah, and maybe also, uh, if anyone else has any additional questions uh, in response to the the, uh, the two talks, it's a, it's a possibility. There are people cool. there, yeah. But um, if not, in the meantime, uh, yes, this. Could you maybe expand more on what you mean by the shift? towards Vietnam and its ecological uh, kind of like as the site of, of, of ecology in the, the 60s and 70s? I'm not sure if I exactly follow what you... Well, I think the, the, the images of the use of chemical air okay. toxins, for example, they circulated widely um, on, in mass media but they were typically shown in the context of Vietnam. They weren't shown in the context of global agriculture, for example. Um, and I think that that enabled uh, uh, a kind of repression of the development of environmental urgency to take place over a course of 30, 40 years that cost environmental concerns significant time, significant. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe I yeah I could add, maybe add, add to that 
Um, oh, oh, before that, though, I did want on the helicopter. <laughs> so mash. This is maybe what I was just kind of mm. rather glibly referring to as allegorical, but um, Mash is set in the Korean War, uh, but it's really about the Vietnam War. You know, and we, I, for those of us who grew up with this stuff, I don't know, this is like the intergenerational thing, but that, that you know, you couldn't miss that. You couldn't miss that you were actually watching a TV show that, that was, you know, because it was really still, I think, at the time that the show premiered, uh, difficult in the kind of you know uh, the the sort of public sphere, uh, televisual public sphere to criticize uh, U.S. foreign policy uh, directly. So they did it indirectly, and and so that that may be, I, I think, and, and I, don't, I can't reconstruct exactly the sequence. The Apocalypse Now is sort of the, and the Deer Hunter are the two films that I at mm. least associate with this turn in which the you know, the violence over there perpetrated uh, by by these systems that you're talking about uh, came home in different ways uh, and, and was acknowledged back, you know, and particularly in Deer Hunter, it was all about coming home to Pennsylvania from the, from Vietnam. Um, but on the on the environmental thing. So, OK, Koya was referring to something that, that, that I had, you know, called attention to in in my own in this book about postmodernism that they were kindly is kindly acknowledged in, in the were included in the show in Bhopal so so basically in the early 1980s Union Carbide which is one of the agents of the Green Revolution in South Asia um, they make fertilizers among other things they were that's what they were doing they they built this new Kevin Roche designed a corporate postmodern Headquarters that's in in the you can see it in the show uh, for uh, for uh, Union Carbide in Connecticut, in which the air and everything else about it, the furniture, the the whole environment, was very carefully uh, controlled and individualized. Everybody had like, their own thermostats in their offices and all the very specific ways of producing or reproducing. So this is basically, Sylvia, I would I say, yes, processes of normalization in various ways, in this case of suburban corporate life and, and its subjects. Are, are, this is a machine for that type of thing, that, this, this building. Uh, meanwhile, at the same time, uh, Union Carbide was, open, uh, was operating to pesticide plants, including the one in Bhopal in India, that, uh, in which uh, 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 a leak of the um, deadly uh, gas produced there killed uncounted numbers, because they literally are uncounted, uh, but thousands certainly, mm -hmm. of people working and living near the plant, usually in, living in the, in the sort of uh, slums around the plant. So, so that air was was the, so. There's, there's different kinds of air, right? There's there's the air in Connecticut, which is carefully controlled and air conditioned and modulated, and then there's the poisonous air in Bhopal, and they're produced and and they belong to the same entity, and and that's that's kind of what I was just alluding to now, in trying to think about this as belonging to a world system, so that 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 we can, you know, world systems would, would talk about one as center and then periphery or semi-periphery, but, but, you know, whether or not you want to use that language, basically the idea that what's happening over here and what's happening over here are intimately related, uh, but structurally, uh, they're, they're, meant, they're meant to be disarticulated. And, that, and that, that was why it took so long for the victims of this to get any kind of justice. And in fact, they, most of them, they, did, they got nothing. But... Um, uh, because there was all, there were all these layers of mediation between what was going on in Connecticut and what happened in Bhopal. Mm -hmm. Kolya has a question. I don't know, do we have time? I have a question to you, Reinhold, um, and especially yeah. the example of Roger Scruton. Um, in criticisms of post Modernism, for example, like postmodernism, is to be blamed for Donald Trump because yeah. postmodernism is all about like there's no rules anymore, there's no criteria, everybody everybody can do what they want. Um, it's 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 clearly a misunderstanding of postmodernism. But is it would it, would it be too simple or too blunt uh, to go uh, even further and say these assertions of power by referencing what 
has always been done or what has been done in the antique or what has been done in Thomas Jefferson's office, um, that these conservative um, critiques of postmodernism are actually the, the voluntary uh, gestures of sheer power without any criteria. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, I mean, so in, we were talking about this earlier, but in the in the states, probably I don't know, somebody, what do you think? In in the states, I, I, the the kind of recently at least the um, target has been critical race theory, which is a form of legal theory. There's, you know, they almost never actually explain it or even have any idea what they're actually referring to. But but it's a form of legal theory that derives from from post-structuralist and other forms of, you know, critiques of, of legal texts, of their assumptions, of the structures, of structural, you know, uh, domination that are kind of inscribed into the terminology and the, the framing of, uh, of legal thought, and racially speaking, right? So, so you know, and, I, and they, they blame everything on critical race theory. So... I think what I'm trying to explain is that there is a project. There's a there's a there's a philosophical and political project that is a. It's not just setting up these you know straw figures to knock down, you know the easy targets of pluralism and relativism and whatever. But but there's a there's a positive and I think very quite deadly project that that is you know under. It's under construction over here, while while all these other things are going on over here. Um, so it's the same people. It's in in Florida. Florida is sort of ground zero for that. The, the people, the scrutins people. The, the, these are the, it's the Ron DeSantis uh, crowd in Florida. Well, while they're rewriting high school textbooks and and banning the so-called teaching of critical race theory, they are attempting to make Florida beautiful again in other ways. So the the um, the these two things go together. Uh, and I, I don't, you know, I think there is a, the, the kind of ease with which um, all that is solid really does melt into air in in postmodernist discourse, and it becomes difficult to to ground anything. And this is a constant debate, has been since day one of of you know amongst theorists, amongst in architecture too. Uh, 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 about, you know, um, ultimately, where do you stand? Mm. It's very clear where these people stand. <laughs> but it's <laughs> sometimes very, the postmodern parts of American politics involves that there's a lot of violence going on, right? There's yeah. things happening in certain places, and you're able to ignore it. And sometimes you elect people that you think are the good guy, and they continue to ignore it. Yeah. And by ignoring them, as we seem to be doing right now, both where they are and who's in power yeah. and acknowledging that maybe they're just slightly worse than those guys that you're talking about, you're contributing a massive, massive, uh, you know, crime against your conscience. And that's part of, I think, my generation's uh, yeah. realization in a way, uh, not to speak generationally, but that, or, or get too political, that, 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 that uh, yeah, that you can't continue to be blackmailed into some situations because of uh, how vulgar the other side can be as well. Mm -hmm. but yeah, I see what you're saying. Just because something's in such bad taste as a column, I don't know, yeah. Yeah. We're actually getting questions. Hmm. Uh, are we on time? Uh, is there enough time? Well, thank, it's the last question. Okay, thank you, sorry. Um, this uh, question goes to Sylvia uh, Levin. Thank you so much for um, your observations. Sorry, I have to go away from the light a bit because <laughs> it's too crazy. Um, but my question goes uh, straight into the question of um, the questions of perspective that you have introduced in your lecture. Since uh, there is no looking away from the political and the economic point of view, but it's just like distancing itself. And I think the analogies and the allegories that you uh, actually brought into um, this field of how to understand postmodernism now is uh, also regarding how the toxicity and the artificiality of the bug also allows uh, 
an understanding of how artificial is the relationship from humans to nature as well. So I wonder what you have, um, what are your perspectives also, what conclusions have you brought in uh, looking at how Denise Scott Brown would look at architecture from above, um, how the military would look to people that would look like insects from that that from that distance, so to speak, um, how that also relates to, um, yeah, social political understanding of this technological development and its impact for future uh, amalgamations of power and social order uh, or disorder, and uh, to how architecture um, and this humanizing, dehumanizing aspects of this perspective, new perspective through the inclusion of helicopters to as a as a yeah aleatory device for different uh, interest. How this also uh, catapults through cartoons. You brought one, but I can think of so many that come after that. All the Marvel idea of like how in insects and toxicity can be. Uh, an enemy, although it's just like demonization of nature. Um, yeah, <laughs> you have brought all these things together and I would like to hear more about your own perspective to that. Thank you. Um, th thank you for that question. Um, I'll, I'll do my best to not answer, <laughs> but respond maybe in ways that relate to the conversation also that we're, we're having. Um, because I, I wonder about the difference so, so, Reinhold, there's something in the way that you describe the union carbide problem mm -hmm. um, is as a, a kind of structured ignorance, right? That it requires that it's a that the way the corporate global system is set up that it produces deliberate agnatological not knowing. Yeah. Um, so that that's that's one way to sort of understand the structure of the problem. Um, another way to understand, and none of these are, nobody has to pick, like these could all be happening at the same time. This will get maybe a little bit to the helicopter, but um, there, there could also be a, kind of the, the ability to tolerate having knowing, yeah. not not knowing, but actually knowing, yes. and then what do you do? And I guess this was part of what I was trying to say about the helicopter. Um, there was no way you could get in a helicopter in the 1960s, at least in the United States, with not without understanding that you were in a military device, that pilots were all helicopters. I mean, that this was widely available. There was no structuring that meant that countless people were dying that you didn't know about. You knew about them. So I'm... I'm interested in the availability of that kind of information and what people did with it. And so at least for some period of time, I mean, and I don't, I don't know the answer to that, right? But I think about, I think about the slipperiness of somebody like Obama, for example, a very slippery character, you know, um, what he knew and what he didn't know and what he should have known better. I don't know how to parse my way through to that. By the time you get to the Greenbergs and the Creers and the Trumps, there's no... There's no difficulty in understanding what the what the politics are, right? So, the the more slippery characters are, you know, are they deliberately obfuscating? Like, is Obama the you know the most postmodern politic? You know, in other words, Trump, uh, Trump is according to the vocabulary that we've been, you know, b being asked to use, Trump is post-postmodern. I mean, totally clear what he's up to. Nothing slippery, nothing underhanded, no manipulation of media, just out there. Obama would be the much more um, so what, what do you make of that? figure. Just, we, unfortunately, I think we have to, are a bit out of time, but I'm so fascinated about what you think of Biden then, because... Uh, 
<laughs> Biden is a Biden is a time machine. Yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, <laughs> he's, like, he's kind he's of an, an old modernist. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, like, I mean, he's like the first. He drove the helicopter. I don't know. Right, I mean, he's like. Well, he's I think he pilot. is the, the helicopter pilot. Okay, a <laughs> phantom. The maybe. Yeah. yeah, he's got the glasses, right? The Real, well, thank you, and uh, thank you, Kolya, and everyone. I think this is uh, the end of our session here. All right. Very good. Thank you, Noah. Thank you. Thank you.